Good morning. Hi, morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you again, BB. Oh. oh, you see BB. Hi, BB. Hello, sorry, my I was mute. Oh, whoa, many people. Yeah. Whoa. And also many people who haven't shown up before. So that's great. We are expanding the audience. Hi, Simona. <laughs> Hi, Anka. I'm always here, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gabriela, Julia is there. Good. Yeah. Oh, Jan is there as well. Wow, welcome. Good to see you. Great. Yeah. Okay, uh, Eva has shown up. Um, I think we let's just start with... I will start by shortly introducing uh, the, our two guests of today. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that they're here. It's Masjia Rain and Talinaz. And, um, well, it's also uh, fortunate that we can do these kind of talks online because it makes it possible for Tale and Masjia to just drop in on a Wednesday morning and be with us for a few hours. And something like that would have been much more difficult if you had to do the traveling. But we're all longing for traveling again. So I'm sure that uh, somewhere in the future, Ma Tale and Maziar will come and visit Minerva again. And they have done that. So they've both been uh, in, in Minerva a few years ago. And um, well, they, they are a close connection of mine. I, I even consider them to be friends. Eh? That's what happens when colleagues meet a lot, they become friends. So that's what we, uh, what we did. Um, Maziar and me, we go back even 17 years, so that's a lot. It's, um, it was during my job uh, in uh, Utrecht that we started to work together and we always find possibilities to continue working together because I find Maziar a really very, very inspiring figure. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he always thinks his lectures are not really good and Tale, I met you uh, a few years ago and um, 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 what, in what, what was the circumstance that we met? Just the Artistic Research Week. Okay, and now I remember. Good. I do remember. I came to, to Kio for the Artistic Research Week and I was in the plane together with Michiel uh, Janssen and he said to me, I'm reading this interesting uh, scenario play from a person called Talinas, and they told me she's really interesting. And then I just popped up, we, we just met. And from that on, we, we, we start talking and we didn't stop talking. Okay, so um, today, um, well, the, the, the talks of the um, artistic research community are uh, about uh, artistic research. It can be artistic research practices of people that are brought in. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was at the Artistic Research Week in Kio, but online. And I heard Maziar and Tale talking in a, a setting called uh, Vulnerability in Artistic Research. And uh, I invited them to do a bit of the same talk uh, this morning with us. We have one hour and um, it can be a bit more. Um, it will be like this. Uh, Tale and Maziar will both do a talk of about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we will just... Um, I have a, a chat, a discussion, whatever uh, about it. Okay, um, who of the two of you wants to, Maziar will start. Okay. I think the way we planned it was that I kick it off. Thank you very <laughs> much, Anke, for inviting us as ever. It's really a great pleasure to be with you guys in the Netherlands. Um, you always feel you have to say that at the beginning of a talk, just to be polite. But I, I really mean that quite sincerely. It's always been really lovely collaborating with you guys, especially at uh, Minerva. Um, in fact, yes, Toller and I met through Anke and Michel. Uh, we were in the same institution, but we'd never talked to each other. And uh, we managed to hit it off. And uh, we've been working on two or one research project, but in two phases over the last three or four years uh, together and quite an unusual pairing of a playwright and a graphic designer. Uh, just very briefly about me, I trained as a fine artist at St. Martin's School of Art in the 80s. I 
got sick of fine art one day and I changed my life and became a graphic designer. Taleb, maybe you could say a little bit about your background. So uh, my background is actually as an author, a traditional author writing poetry and uh, novels. And I was kidnapped into theater at the age of 30 and started to try to figure out what on earth is playwriting? What is a performative text? What is it to write for a body and a voice and not for the page? And uh, that actually uh, took me into probably all my, my playwriting has been a kind of artistic research in a way. And I'm try still trying to figure it out. But at the moment I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a freelance researcher and still doing uh, plays and installations and audio works um, as, a, as, an, as an artist. And you recently achieved your PhD at, uh, at our college, at the Oslo Aca National Academy of Arts uh, in, in artistic research. Yes, and, and in playwriting. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Tala and I have been circling around is, is a sort of, and it's sort of emerged as we talked more and more, is the idea of ethics in our, in our work. I think we both follow that as a thread through our work. So I think what we're going to do today is kind of uh, bounce off the theme of ethics in various ways uh, throughout the hour we've got with you. The way we've structured it is that I'm going to talk a little bit about vulnerability, and um, disinheritance, which are the themes I've been looking at. And then Tala will pick up and look at uh, the issue of, um, of reciprocity in her work. Uh, that is, was a major part of her research. And then at, after both our individual talks, then we will talk about it in terms of uh, artistic research and invite you guys into the conversation. Uh, so with... Uh, without any further to do, as we say in English. Um, uh, the, the term vulnerability really came up when I watched a talk by one of my former colleagues, uh, uh, an artist who I knew from the time when I was an artist in London at Cubit Studios called Anne-Marie Creamer. And Anne-Marie gave a talk at Central St. Martins about a year ago now. And she came up with the term vulnerability and it suddenly kind of rang true for me and, and Tala when we began to use it as a theme. And Marie uh, sadly got uh, 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 sort of cancer in her backbone and very quickly overnight she became ill. And as she began to go through the process of getting better when she is, which is really lovely news, she began to see links between what she in terms of her personal illness and what was happening to her an artist and how actually the illness was generating ideas about art for her uh, while socially it was seen as an embarrassment. So I'm just going to pick up on that as a beginning point. Please forgive me, I get so nervous. Uh, Anka mentioned that I get very, very, so I'm just going to read a text. Um, I think, if anything, the events of the last year have shown us is how fragile our societies are, or rather how fragile they could be if it wasn't for the resilience of lots of creative people, not just in the arts, but everywhere. Uh, and I think we've been shown to be fragile, both physically, biologically, economically, and socially. I'm not a sociologist, so my reasoning here is based on my personal observations, but maybe we should be looking at how we as a society and as individuals within it want to see ourselves as invulnerable to fragilities of life. Or maybe we hide our invulnerabilities under the cloak of privacy, and in public we wish to appear confident, invulnerable, positive achievers, dealing with the slings and arrows, as Shakespeare calls it, of outrageous fortune. Uh, so the joke in England is when you ask somebody, how are you? And then they actually tell you how they are and they tell you they've been ill or on, and you just think, oh my God, you know, they're actually telling me how they are rather than saying, I'm well, thank you. Always for me is a kind of joke, but it always reveals this hypocrisy of manners that we have as a society. Manners that insulate us from truths from each other and hide uh, what my friend uh, and writer, Pat Williams described as the bottom line in society. We somehow, don't see this bottom line in society. On our advice many, many years ago, it's over 20 years ago, uh, when I was at a quite a low point in my life, Pat Williams suggested that I joined the Samaritans, which was an organization in England, which helps people through difficult periods of their lives, uh, especially if you're suicidal, there is a phone line service. And I became one of the volunteers there and I listened to people. 
uh, on uh, yeah on a regular basis. People who are on the edge of uh, suicide, unhappiness, at very difficult points in their life. Uh, the skill that you get taught is this sort of non-judgmental listening, where you're just there to support somebody. And what really shocked me was how many people who, on the surface, were seen as successful in the eyes of the world. Some of them famous. Uh, amongst them you know, very famous people who would appear on television, for instance, uh, were vulnerable and desperate uh, underneath. And this idea of vulnerability has always kind of stayed with me from those days about how we have these different selves that we show in different ways. Um, vulnerability, as the moral philosopher Alastair McIntyre describes in his book, After Virtue, is the position one finds oneself as opposed to the ideas of self-sufficiency, autonomy, will, of power, of agency, when sketching out models of good life. So vulnerability, as he describes it, is the juxtaposition to this idea of uh, being able to be self-sufficient and autonomous. Uh, and we live in a culture that's increasingly run after the vision that runs after the vision of, or the gloss of self-sufficiency, the sheen of uh, image of social media, that happiness is delivered to us through influences and the mainstream media of celebrity, for instance. Happiness and a meaningful life is the result of agency of will, of success, of achievement, of individual efforts. As we see stars appear on our TV screens and talk about their latest films, for instance, ignoring the army of people that are in the background making these these things happen. So this idea of the individual happy, happiness um, is one that's dominant in our culture at the moment, in the, in the dialogue and the discourse of our culture. Uh, uh, and we can talk a bit about that later on, which is one of the subjects Tala and I have been researching. Uh, society as spectacle, as Guy Debord argued in the 40s and 50s, uh, through the situationist movement, has descended in, into an endless circle of consumption. Our ability to have a future which demands of us a degree of predictability in our social structures, to plan and to engage, uh, is a necessary condition of being able to find life meaningful, again quoting McIntyre. But the pervasive and unpredictability in human life also renders all our plans, projects permanently vulnerable and fragile, he says. And we have replaced the certainty of the existential dilemma uh, with the certainty of consumption. So we, we're all aware that we're all gonna die. Um, all of us here are gonna die one day. And that, that dread that, uh, uh, that, that statement raises is always kind of pushed away, kicked down the road, as we say in English, through the act of consumption, of entertainment, of spectacle. Uh, I think, therefore, I shop, as Bar Barbara Kruger famously put it. So we live in a paradox which has been sharply contrasted uh, for us during this year of the pandemic, that our lives are unpredictable. The illusion of predictability is fragile. As social science, as social science and philosophers, philosophers have long been saying, yet we cho choose to live uh, through this rose-tinted window of uh, predictability. The tyranny of optimism, for instance, has always uh, interested me uh, that somehow we're all supposed to be optimistic, yet we need to, in some sense to be cynical. Uh, and I think the best result I ever found was Antonio Gramsci's comment, the pessimism, pessimism of the intellect and the opt optimism of the will. That contrast between the two for me is this balance that we have to negotiate in our thinking. So here I want to propose that vulnerability is a, great, a glorious moment of unsituatedness, a moment when our certainties are removed and we are enabled through circumstance to see the world from a different perspective. Empathy, for instance, is one of the issues. Only when you're ill or when you're vulnerable or when you're going through emotional or psychological trauma are you able to understand the pain of others in any depth. So now here in an audience of artists and designers, we can say, no big deal, I'm aware of that one. Artists are full of empathy. Uh, they often imagine the world from different perspectives. So maybe in a way that a group of economics or management uh, institutionalists would find difficult to acknowledge and have insights into. Uh, many, of the, uh, many of us work and live in an unsituated uh, discourse. 
and through our, through the acts of making and do, doing, we bring perspectives to the uh, to the uh, we we bring new perspectives and make these unsituated uh, experiences more tangible for ourselves. I'm using a broad brushstroke here. I think just to make a point. I understand that there are many nuanced, uh, there's a spectrum of, of nuances here, but this is just a broad brushstroke. Um, but we as artists operate within contexts of institutions, galleries, museums, art markets, um, art academies, and operations for critical discourse like journals, critical theories uh, that could be seen as products of institutional foundations of our society, which McIntyre puts as characteristically form a single causal order in which the ideals and the creativity of the practice are always vulnerable to the acquisitiveness of the institution in which the cooperative care for common goods for the practice is always vulnerable to the competitiveness of the institution. It's quite a bit of a mouthful from a Scottish philosopher, but I think he's saying there that we are, um, that the act of creativity itself is vulnerable to the, to the institutions through which we live and operate. And I think here I'd like to make a link to the next theme that for me goes hand in hand with vulnerability, which is a theme of disinheritance. Um, so hope is what we have when we do not have predictability. When I don't know what the world will be like, I have hope that it will be something, hence this idea of optimism. And much of what we provide is hope is the absence of certainty of our futures. It fills the gaps of, in of our uncertainties. It's aspirational in that it has elements of longing in it. Hope itself is vulnerable in that it fills the place of vulnerability yet is still prone to it. So here I want to introduce the idea of disinheritance which I've been working with for a few years now. I first used this theme when Anke asked, us, asked me to give a talk at uh, Minerva a few years ago. Uh, and I came across the work, uh, uh, the term uh, disinheritance in, in the work of Ruth Parra Jahavala, Jahavala, a very difficult Indian name to pronounce, I'm afraid. Um, and she's a, she's a writer. Uh, she was of German Jewish descent. And uh, during the Nazi period, she went through this experience of this inheritance. Um, the conference in which I gave this talk was, uh, uh, was organized by Anke and Bibi, and it was around uh, Michel Foucault's idea of speaking truth to power, this, the term para, parahesia, parahesia. My pronunciation of Greek is uh, just as bad as my pronunciation of Norwegian, uh, the, the country I live in at the moment. So please forgive me for that, Bibi. Uh, my perspective was based on the idea, on the basis of how when we speak to power, to speak truth to power, which is the idea Michel Foucault was pro propagating, uh, I wanted to distinguish how we as artists speak, speak from uh, more exposed and personal positions, private positions in the private domain, while uh, people like Foucault, who were espousing uh, social ideals talk in the public domain from the public domain uh, with the certainties of social structures and theoretical discourses around them. Uh, Ruth Pawa Jahabala talks about powerfully uh, that how as the Nazis took over her cultural milieu, that sophisticated educated Jew living in Germany in the 1930s, she says, they should have been my most formative years, and maybe they were, I don't know, together with the early happy Jewish, German Jewish bourgeois family life of 1927 to 33, they should be that profound well of memory and experience, childhood and ancestral, from which a writer I should have, from which as a writer I should have drawn. I never have, I don't know why not. I don't know that they were the beginning of my disinheritance, the way they are for other writers, of their inheritance. So to be disinherited is to lose one's sense of entitlement to certain values, ideas, and attributes, to lose one's network of formulations for social interactions that engage us to relate to others, 
Um, there's a hilarious story of very quickly of when I went to England, our neighbors invited us for a walk, our family. And we did what we did as Iranians. Uh, I'm Iranian by birth, uh, which is to put on our best clothes, imagining we were gonna walk down the main street and meet other families. And we knocked on their door and they turned up in walking gears and, and big boots and sandwiches. They wanted to go for a hike in the countryside, in the, in the park. And for us, the idea of the walk were com completely contradictory experiences. So the immigrant, the exile or the incomer very quickly gets insights into how an, uh, as an individual, one's actions are not accorded to the value and acknowledgement uh, that in their own eyes they're entitled to. The displacement of one's legitimized role is disempowering. And our contemporary culture of mass movements of people due to the war, wars, for instance, is a witness of this manifestation at the moment. But there are, sorts of disinher there are other sorts of disinheritance in play at the moment. Women, people of color, the poor, the politically disenfranchised have made it clear in, in their demands for legitimate equality of rights. And this has caused the sense of dis inheritance for those who have been previously entitled to certain unquestioned privileges. Certainly we can see Trump and Brexit as an example, as a manifestation of this phenomena. So there are groups of people within our societies at the moment, all feeling that they have been disinherited from their values. And this causes vulnerabilities in them. All sorts of vulnerabilities appear to them. So power and the rights, uh, and the rights uh, to it uh, sit somewhere at the center of this new situation. Uh, and as yet, this is an unknown, uh, the unknown outcomes of this struggle uh, will make itself valid in time. For me, these are parallels and social uh, and cultural phenomena are also mir mirrored in the way we in the area of the arts and research are trying to validate the legitimacy of our knowledge. So we'll talk more about this in a second when after Tala's talk, but I just wanted to share uh, the fantastic Douglas Adams who wrote to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he said, we demand, uh, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. And that to me was a fantastic way to look at artistic research. But he also said uh, about a, one of his characters said in one of his books when he drank something, that it's almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. It's a very English way of <laughs> trying to express doubt. Uh, so I think I'll just stop there and then hand over to Tale, uh, and then we'll pick up uh, a bit later on together. Tale. Thank you, Mazia, uh, for that. It's um, um, very inspiring. What we normally do, me and Mazia, is to enter into dialogue. So it was really refreshing, Mazia, to actually experience a monologue from your side uh, and a very thought out uh, monologue as well. Uh, I thought I'd start a little bit just by, by placing my, my research uh, and uh, my art in, in one and the same category, because that's what artistic research is about. But for me, uh, the artistic research I did started up from a very sort of personal um, experience. I had this experience, as I call it, of an ethical tension. And please forgive me, Bibi and Anke, because you've heard this before, but I will repeat it anyway, because I think it might clear my, my position when it comes to, to reciprocation uh, as you move along. So I, I, was, I felt I was living in this kind of ethical tension. It was like I was inside a global economy that, uh, that I couldn't, um, I couldn't, cope with and when I say cope with I couldn't cope with it uh, neither intellectually nor emotionally it I have this example I often use uh, of going to buy a coffee at a coffee shop then buying a t-shirt and the t-shirt costing me less than the coffee and then buying a cheese a nice uh, piece of cheese and that cost me the, the, the double the price of the t-shirt and the coffee and I was eating this and wearing that cotton t-shirt and feeling as if I was having the whole global economy inside me I was eating it shitting it wearing it and there was no way of escaping it although I knew that this economical system this this system of production and cons, uh, cons, um, consuming uh, was not a, 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 a system that I wanted to be a part of I was and I wasn't only consuming it, I was actually enjoying the luxury, luxuries of being a part of it, being at the very, very top of this, uh, this pyramid of, of uh, consumption and power that we are in Scandinavia, because we are so very well off. 
I felt in a way like I was a queen of a rubbish heap that I didn't want to be a part of. And then I realized there was no way I could express this artistically in my playwriting. It was as if there was no connection between my art production and this very, very heavy feeling of nausea. I would call it a feeling of nausea that I was experiencing. Um, and uh, I started thinking, why is this? How can I not express it the way I want? And how would it be possible for me to express it? At the same time, there was a big debate in literature and arts in Norway, um, uh, based in, in a kind of new genre of literature that was placing not only the, uh, the individual at the center of the art, but the individual experience, the actual biography, the, the real person, writers using their own names, uh, the wife's names, the children and so on in, in their art. And a kind of shift towards saying that this, this was a kind of more of an honest art, this was real art, to go through your own experience, to, to find your own voice, a kind of romantic idea really that was where the real um, art production was happening that was the real exciting art happening and at the same time I felt that uh, my own private feelings became less and less interesting because my big emotions and thoughts happened when I collided with the world with this global economy with this t-shirt um, with what was happening around me so I started questioning this whole idea of uh, how, how I was producing my art and this idea of having your own voice and the idea of where art comes from. Uh, and it left me feeling very vulnerable. Uh, it left me feeling that I didn't have the tools uh, artistically to express what I wanted to express. So this brought me into my PhD project. And what I did in this project was developing both methods and reflections and formal new formal solutions uh, for, for playwriting as I went along. And my main task was then not to go inward, not to construct a history or a, or a, or a craft a history or a plot or an idea or a, or a piece or, or, or a thought, but to make it happen through exposing myself completely open to what went on outside me. It could be a new story, it could be uh, some, something I read on Facebook, it could be something that I engage with in a conversation. Uh, and this idea of reciprocation, taking in, really in, into consideration the fact that I was as exposed to the material as the ex material was giving itself to me, that I was as willing to change with the material, that my voice was, uh, I was willing to even give up the voice I, uh, I presumed of as being good, my, even my aesthetics, my sense of the aesthetics, to, um, to gratify or to, to be honest to that meeting with, with what happened extern externally outside of me. And it led me into a five year exploration where I've been working both with uh, collective writing, even leaving the idea of authorship. Uh, I've been working with um, uh, gathering material and, and assembling as assemblages, really inspired by Deleuze and, and guitarist uh, Machine Assemblage, working in feedback loop with one material continually, continuously influencing the other and giving away from the boundaries between the personal and the political, really trying to look aside from it and to move aside from it. And in that, um, in that project, of course, uh, an artistic reflection, writing about your work is as important as writing the work. Uh, it's very peculiar when you're a writer because you don't change your media when you reflect. I mean, if you're a potter or you're, you're a filmmaker or you're a, you work with performance uh, work in theater with your body and your voice, you don't, you don't write per se as your art production. But what I had to do was to find a way to write about my writing, uh, which was challenging in itself. And uh, through the meeting of Masayar, then I realized that one of the methods I've been looking at was what we call the metalogues. So in a way, uh, the, the reflection um, in itself is dialogical. It's not monological as such. It's not me um, pouring out reflections upon my work, uh, but it's me meeting in a conversation around a theme, a topic, a theory, another voice, uh, and also uh, later on uh, writing together with, with other other um, researchers around my work. And this, uh, this um, idea of the metalogue um, is uh, you know, generated from Gregory Bateson, who is a very central theoretician, both uh, in biology and in system theory, and also when it comes to, uh, to research and geographers. And it has this idea of the conversation or the dialogue as a form of, uh, of, um, of reflection. So, 
in a way, what I what, the reason why I want to sort of go through all this is that at the core of all this, I realized uh, uh, as I moved into my research and as I also work with it now, is that the idea of it is in some way the idea of reciprocation, the idea of generating artistic work and generating an ethics through that artistic work that has to do with acknowledging the fact that you are created in the meeting with the other. At the core of, a sort of theoretical core of this, I've been reading uh, over and over again the works by uh, the Lithuanian philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who says that we are not as such who we are in ourselves. We are created through the meeting with the other. It's by being heard, seen, listened to, exposed to, and engaging with the other that we become who we are. And in, in, the, in opening up to that vulnerability of the gaze, of the meaning, of the feeling of the other, uh, you also have to open up the change the other can inflict on you. So I've been really interested in lately in the ethics of change and the idea of uh, reciprocation in that change. In Norway, we call it head. So what I give to you, I must be willing to receive. Um, and the exchange of that, both in my work and, uh, and in my praxis. And of course, it involves a risk. Artistically, it can involve a risk of the, of the work actually not becoming very good. I mean, that's of course often a very big risk that we are very rarely willing to take. But as we also know, that's often where the, where the, where the big rewards are. On the other side, the risk is also in, in exposing yourself to to uncertainty, uh, to lack to lack of, of means, um, the, the the craft you've been practicing, the, the tools you've been using might not be available for you at the moment, uh, and also you might have to change even the perspectives of what is aesthetically good. For instance, what is a good play? What is it to be an author? What is it to own your own work? When do you actually own your work? Uh, and who? Why is that so interesting for you to do? So even the idea of of the artwork as an object. So in a way, what happens then is you, you're entering the sphere what we call relational arts or relational, even a relational reflection. A reflection that is not, not done alone, an artwork that doesn't happen in an isolated sphere of the artist's mind, but that exists in a meeting place, reciprocal meeting place. And that meeting place could be many places. It could be this space we're in now, for instance. It could be the institution or it could be inside the artwork itself, or it could be in theater between uh, the theater maker and the audience. And I've been looking at all these uh, potential places for these, uh, these uh, cracks or risks or potential uh, vulnerable positions to be in as a fruitful place, as a productive place, as a never ending workspace. So one text leads to another text, one meeting leads to another meeting, one thought leads to another meeting and another thought, uh, like we do in a conversation, when you actually realize that you've been thinking something, making something, doing something that you, you wouldn't do, that you, you wouldn't necessarily like or enjoy or even know existed if it, this meeting didn't take place. And if you weren't open to that meeting, if you weren't willing to take the actual risk of being in that meeting and making it change you. It feels like the end. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I jump in here, Tali? Yeah, I think so. I, I was really struck by what you said, uh, uh, and I thought maybe here we can start having the discussions that we normally do, Tala and I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that really struck me is this idea that you just described, the last thing, that, you, that this constant meeting of new works, new texts, new ideas. So that the idea that when you're in a relational, uh, uh, I was about to say relational relationship, that's a very crude <laughs> use of the English language, please forgive me, but when you're in a relational situation uh, um, in terms of reflection and research, uh, then you step back from method and you step into process. Mm -hmm. And for me, the two are um, uh, a distinct uh, opposition to each other. For me, Method is often, in terms of research, a managerial tool. It gets us to a point. It gets us to an objective. It gets us to an outcome. While process is often much more creative. It's much more driven by curiosity, by the demands of the research uh, phenomena that you're involved with, the, the conceptualization of it, the, uh, 
re uh, referential frameworks that you're having to create. So, and, and I was really struck by that. And this is something that you've managed to do in your work, which is to bridge rather beautifully between reflection and method itself or process itself. Uh, well, well Shrunk and Berghoff say in the, in the book on artistic research that it's actually the activity of border crossing that as the, is at the core, <laughs> is at the core of the artistic research practice. For me, then, that has become the core of my artistic practice as such. The idea of crossing borders, both inside myself and in, in between and inside my craft with my artwork, but also then the borders that are between the private sphere and, 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 the, and the public sphere. Of course, theatre is, is interesting, Mozia. It, it resembles design in a way because theatre is also in itself a public affair. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we really realise that now during the corona. I mean, the theatres are closed, so we can't practice our craft. I mean, it happens in the meeting place where we are together publicly. Uh, and as a design, we are all constantly looking outside, you know, the art practice of writing or, or rehearsing or, or developing concepts or whatever it is that is involved in, in, the, in the making of the art, because the end product is the meeting with the audience. And like a designer, you're also I'm working for something that's going to happen in the public sphere. So, I mean, this... This, this idea of border crossing then, when it comes to uh, process and the mythology, aren't really that separate as, as it might seem. I mean, for, for me, it's been really, really important to develop new mythology to, to, to aid the, the, the creative process. For instance, the idea of, of collective writing where one writes together or, or um, finding ways of, of um, facilitating conversations or, or meeting uh, places around topics and, uh, and even terms, I mean, using methods that then uh, facilitates the process, if that makes any sense. And the act of research is about going to a border or rather going to, uh, yeah, one of my colleagues here, Shesh D. Brown said to me, I'm not interested in borders. I'm interested from centers from which we radiate out. And borders are very clearly defined things, mm -hmm. while we very quickly in research, especially on the artistic research, I suggest, discover that there aren't these clear divisions over which we can step over. I think that's one of the things that distinguishes us from science. I, I remember going to a seminar on the human brain in, in London, and uh, one person presented ideas around dyslexia and synesthesia and uh, sorry about dyslexia and and Asperger's and the next person was presenting um, ideas around synesthesia you know when we can hear colors and this kind of and they both operate in a similar part of the brain but when they were asked questions about their knowledge they both the scientists said oh, I'm really sorry you should ask the other person about this I don't know and this idea of the I don't know is very clear in science, while in our field, in the arts, the, the borders which we go to are blurry. They're not finite lines. So we, we, we drift into this unknown. And I, and I like this idea of kind of working with these blurred edges rather than these definitive. So for me, one of the problems of artistic research is this research question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can never come up with a question. I can come up with 150 questions and most of them I can't answer, <laughs> but there we go. Uh, how, what did you do with the research question? Yes, I was about to say, what did you do with that? I was about to say, how did you finagle your way through the system here? Well, the thing is, I don't really find the actual, you select a question, right? And you try to select a question that can in some way fathom uh, what you want to research. And usually they're so general and so broadly phrased that they, they're, not, they're not even questions anymore. But the real problem is that you want to answer them. Uh, because when you demand an answer, an, a specific answer to a question, you're actually then both given a kind of a, of a, a map, a roadmap, a, a, a path to, towards to both to the process and to the mythology. And what might happen is that uh, the methodology that might answer, seemingly answer your question and the process that seemingly feeds into your question is not the right one for, what, for the road you want to take, for the research you're actually doing. They, they, might not, they might start not to match 
Uh, and this is this is um, and that's when that's when the gap of vulnerability opens up again, when the answers that is demanded to your questions are not the answers that you're actually getting through your research, uh, and and that's why I think this whole idea of a, of a solid founded kind of um, um, cause and effect uh, question and answer structure of artistic research is not very fruitful. So for me, for once, I changed my research question during my research period. I rephrased it, um, and I could take you through that for a long time. For instance, just just the vocabulary. I used to I used the word we, for instance, and then I started asking myself, but if there's a we, then there's us. Who is this us? Um, I used the word narrative, for instance, narration. Did I really want to narrate? What is it to narrate? Is this a form I want to use, and so on. Uh, and I think the whole actual, if, if we're going to take artistic research seriously, then the whole idea of the artistic research question is not to answer it, but to keep on questioning it. And, uh, and the idea of defending it even becomes ridiculous. I mean, in the, yes. we have this idea that you went through a defense of your work as if it was somehow something that was prone to attack. Well, and, um, it's not necessarily an adversarial situation in the arts. It's more of an inquisitive and yeah. Yeah, and just to, just to finish this off, because I think this is really what we need to talk about when we're going to meet up later again, and everybody can join the discussion, is, is uh, that uh, this idea of defense or this idea of, um, um, of a question that should be answered and that the answer should be viable to the question, this kind of lock, lock-in syndrome, uh, um, leaves us vulnerable when the material we're actually producing or the research we're doing are not matching that, that equation. Uh, and the thing is that if the institution is still sort of really holding on to this structure of questioning questions and answers and, uh, and defense of the, of the research question and the material you develop from it, then, uh, for, for, then you have to, to be able to actually do your research or to do your art, you have to take on an agency. And this is what I thought was so interesting about your talk, uh, Mazia, because you're actually questioning uh, the potential you have when you're in that vulnerable situation of being in the middle of that flux. I mean, even if not even having a language for what you're doing, not really knowing what's happening, because you have all this research going on, you have this art production, but you can't really, you can't really see where it's taking you in that situation uh, of vulnerability, of flux, of shifting, of even making, even creating maybe new language then that's where you need to take on an agency to actually be there to also shape the institution's way of looking at your artistic research. And that's Absolutely, what I have. Yeah. Uh, because there's, there's a flip coin uh, of to say, I don't know is an act of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. To say, I don't know in the arts is to say that within a context mm -hmm. of discourses, traditions, histories. And then on the flip side of that is this idea of disinheritance, the methodologies are often, uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm not confrontational about this, but they, they are, they have their grit in that they, they often don't sit uh, in the same traditions of practice, for instance, or just share the same sensibilities that we have as you as a writer, me as a designer, or somebody from dance, or somebody from music, or somebody from, I mean, there's such a wide, disparate ontological uh, spectrum of, of, uh, of what we call artistic research and each has their own traditions. And these are always a somewhat discomforting relationship with the idea of knowing how to know. Uh, yeah, so there is, there is a sort of problem here that we face that I think we as a community have begun to ask. This tradition of artistic research in England is about 20, 25 years old years old, but it's still not resolved in any way. I'm not a great lover of Donald Rumsfeld, but he made that famous, famous speech about 10 years or 15 years ago when the American Republicans were actually sensible. Uh, but he talked about the known unknowns and uh, known knowns. And, you know, these that kind of there are things that we do know and there are things that we don't we, we think we know and there are things that we don't know we know. Yeah. So there are these kinds of um, the, the very act of asking those questions is is a being put in a position of vulnerability and often we turn to methodology to give us a protective layer while i think process um doesn't give us certainties but it it gives us um 
it, it, it gives us pleasure, I think, maybe in a way that methodologies sometimes don't. The difference between I ought to do this and, and I think I ought to do this. And it gives us adventure, eh? It gives us adventure because mm -hmm. things can show up that you can't predict. I think that's also, that's the pleasure of being an artistic researcher. Maybe it's just, uh, maybe also people are not artistic researchers, but are really researchers and are really open for, for, for new things to come up experience that pleasure mm. Mm. and play and uh, yeah. loss yeah yes uh, but I think there's also another but, another really important point to make since we're talking about ethics here I mean the way we're talking when you talk about vulnerability you end up in ethics and 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 also I think the return of ethics to research or the uh, return of ethics to the arts even and another side of that is the return of uh, rhetorics. I mean, the discussion we have around language, how we use our language, how the language places us, the power of language and so on, which even now we're talking about the research question is in a way a rhetorical question. How do we phrase, how do we phrase, how, how do we phrase the framework around our, our, our actual artistic uh, praxis when we do research mm -hmm. and how, how, rigid, how rigid is that and how much power does that, does that entail? And I think what's really interesting when you talk about ethics, we should sort of think of ethics as one big like uh, uh, thing that uh, that encompasses all. But there are many, many different ways of thinking ethically, uh, and maybe each each uh, process of research, even a conversation like this, has to find its way of thinking or working ethically. For instance, uh, when Anne Marie was talking, your colleague with which had this um, this cancer cancer situation she was very interested in the, the ethics of healing for instance but the ethics of healing is healing is something very different from the ethics of change or the ethic of reciprocation so again i think it's like a vast field for us to start to explore and to use only also as a tool for 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 bringing this together mm. i see a hand going up here and i think maybe we should wind it up and open up for questions around this time but i just want to end also on this one other thing that we've shared in our research and the term for me comes from the work of john wood from design futures at goldsmiths where he talked about languaging mm -hmm. and it comes from matuera and valera's book uh, the, i always i always call it the tree of life and it isn't i'll look it up for you guys but um it's this idea that you can uh, actively language you can create language in order and that's something that you as a writer do which then describes terms that are unknown. And I think they talk about Theodore Lemkin, who after the war, Second World War, tried to persuade the United Nations of the idea of genocide. And nobody would believe what had happened to the Jews. They would just say, oh, that's just a consequence of war. People get killed. And he kept trying to describe it till he took these terms, Gino and side, the Greek of to kill. And when he joined them together, that then began to explain to people that this is something different that happened here. So idea of languaging as an active way of fabricating uh, a knowledge base around your, your research then becomes uh, uh, very empowering, I think. Just yeah. like the word parisia. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Well, I have problems with Michel Foucault, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Bibi, <laughs> say, say that again. I took, yeah. Uh, Hannes. Yeah, Hannes, please come in. Yeah, thanks for these talks. They were really yeah, uh, interesting. But I wanted to comment just a bit on this with the method and the process, because to me, I don't feel like they are contradictory at all, or they don't have to be. I, I understand how they often are, but I think also tying it to the other points we thought you talked about, like um, that we live in a very uncertain world, but it's very much based on this prediction and these assumptions of certainty that then, but that's like an illusion, right? That doesn't, uh, we, we predict the economy, but that doesn't mean that that happens. And I think isn't precisely like methods that allow for process and maneuverability what we need to deal with this? Because we can't, if we are in complete process, then we are in chaos, right? And chaos can be really interesting, but it's really hard to organize. So don't we need methods that allow for process? There's a time for method and there's a time for process, I would say. Uh, in Farsi, the, the, the poet Rumi said, you can't send a kiss via a messenger to your lover. Uh, you know, I can't ask Anke to pass the message on to Tale. It has to be a direct experience. And I think that's the time for process. While for me, method 
is somewhat different. It comes in at different points and it has its function. I wouldn't deny it, absolutely. But I would say at times, especially if the methods are imported from other traditions, it can be uh, somewhat contradictory to our behavior ways. Uh, I remember having to come up with an original contribution to knowledge when I was drawing my MPhil at the Royal College. And it was just literally a book by my foot that fell out that I picked up and I just suddenly thought, oh, no, no, I'm not looking at icons, I'm looking at talismans. And I said this to my supervisor, he said, brilliant, you've made your research question well within your first year, well done. How did you do it? Show me your method. And I couldn't say, well, the book fell, you know, how to then to fabricate, a, <laughs> fabricate a rationale around it rather than I sat in the library so long that something had to give. But Tala, you had something to say there. Uh, I think you're both uh, in, onto something very, very interesting. Uh, the fact that sometimes the process is more important than the method. It's, it's obvious, Monsieur, what we're describing there is absolutely a vital part of, of the way we work. But I think also in my experience that uh, the, the process of languaging that Monsieur uh, was talking about is also was also what I was doing when I worked with method. As, if I was going to languageize that, I would say I was methodizing. <laughs> uh, and, and when the method, I, I chose a method to try and find a way to develop a process, for instance, writing together or being with artists in the room or, or, or having a conversation a particular way with a particular group of people at a particular place or site or time. And then what I realized that as soon as the method was not um, emphasizing the process, I had to change or morph or work with my ways of working with methods. But the methods always help the process in some way or other, also when they didn't work. And this is what I think is really interesting is the fact that often we think about uh, our artistic practice um, as something that is only vital when it works. But for me, it's as vital when it doesn't work. And it's when we do the mistakes, when, when the method has to give, when we have to find other ways of working, working not, uh, new methods to develop, that's as important as when they actually uh, um, uh, are valuable for the process. I think Katie wants to bring up a question. Katie, please come in. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering out loud or thinking out loud, um, isn't it also at certain moments that the process is the method or the method is the process? Um, and because we could think of method as descriptive that we're describing what we're going to do and then it becomes like a conceptual tool but then there's also method in action so method that isn't temporal necessarily but that's just happening and that active moment that is method and process at the same time sometimes or at least that's how I experience it but I'm just wondering if you would have any thoughts on that or if that raises any questions maybe. I think, Katie, that's uh, very much the way it works in, in, in theatre, uh, both, in, both in acting and in developing concepts and, and texts and formats and so on, yes, that these things go very much hand in hand. But I'm not sure that's the same for any other uh, form of, of art production or, or artistic research. So I don't think we can say that it's that method, the way method, method and process are connected is the same for all all um, all fields of arts, or, or but it's definitely uh, a, a very very strong factor in, in theatre making and and performance. Okay, yeah. In design, the idea of method comes from this nineteen sixties Ohm school, you know, that uh, came about uh, as a result of the idea that somehow design was a scientific uh, endeavour, and it failed completely. Nigel Cross, all these people, mm -hmm. including one of my professors at. at uh, at the Royal College, uh, it, it, was, it was a failed endeavor and they're still doing it. So there are now different branches of design. There's people who are part of minor engineering, I would call, who definitely use method as an overarching umbrella. While there are others like myself um, who are more interested in other approaches. So design specifically has this tension between artistic research and process and, and method. Uh, and design again is a broad spectrum there. But I would say the term you used, which was method in action, obviously harks back to Donald Sean's idea of reflection in action, uh, that seminal text of his. And I think what he was doing from an was from an outsider's position, looking at wicked problems and then trying to find how other people have developed these very flexible and maneuverable ways of working ourselves in the arts, architects, designers, 
artists and also people in medicine, strangely enough, I think. Um, so I think there is this other way of approaching being fluid in the flow of the situation and then at times having to stand back. Yeah. yeah. Because also sometimes, just very briefly, sometimes method becomes uh, ideology. <laughs> it yeah. becomes like a, a, a set way of thinking. It ends, we end up in doxa in, in a way. For instance, in in uh, in my in Kiev, where I work, Tostanogov's method has been like the thing to do. That's the method to use. And then, of course, it has nothing to do with process. Then it's just tool. So uh, I mean, uh, there's there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, I think. Um... Elisa wants to ask a question as well. Please come in, Elisa. Hi, thank you. Um, well, I really, really liked your presentations and it, both of them really made me think of the concept of the event also, like this openness where you don't know what will come. Um, and I'm, I'm personally very interested in boundaries actually as an open concept where that sort of chaos or potential is possible. But I'm just really breaking my head over how could it maybe either potential or vulnerability or the things not structured or clear or defined how could how could the sort of the positive side of that influence the structure or maybe method or because i heard one of you say like there's a time for, for each of them um but i'm just hoping isn't there a way to sort of bring them together like in, in the in the fringes where they influence each other constantly in this flux. Um, well, that's. I was wondering how, if you have some thoughts on that. Follow you go first. I think you're <laughs> more equipped to answer this. Well, uh, and the idea of uh, of. Um, of the, or not the method, but the f frame of frame uh, frame of thinking or a, a frame of thinking within of machine as blanche, for instance, that uh, Felix Guattari and uh, Gilles Deleuze are pointing to. That's actually the idea of this reciprocation between method and process, uh, crossing being within boundaries and 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 feeling the edge of what's outside them. I mean, the, the, the constant that they uh, that they clash against or, or emerge against is uh, is the whole engine, the, 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 the thing that drives this machine of thinking, of reflecting, of producing. So for, when you think within that sort of framework and that philosoph philosophical idea or idea of production of art, they would say that it is that merging between mythology, process, action and event that 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 is the is the work in itself uh, and that that produces that that production is enough. But of course, that's also a, that also belongs to particular aesthetics and a particular way of thinking around what art can be. Yeah. And just, uh, just to say very quickly, uh, I work with two typographers and we've done a number of projects together over the years. And uh, one of them, Stefan Elmer, describes uh, artistic research as uh, doubt management he said it because every time we meet as a group to discuss something we start all over again and it's this <laughs> I wish I could say I knew how to do this I can theorize about it but actually when I'm doing it I'm in the same shit as the rest of you guys are so I don't have an answer to that to your question but I would just say that it comes out of a sense of trusting your intuition of knowing which one is right for you at that moment and then I think that's the really important point that uh, Tala's work has done for me, that moment where you stop being an individual researcher, but you're part of a we of researchers, a group of researchers, a community, and you're not in isolation because in isolation, I'm not clever enough to answer things in isolation. Yeah. I always manage it with others. Yeah. Thanks, Amazia. Beautiful said. I don't know who wants to come in first, Jan or Celine. I haven't seen who was first. <laughs> Maybe you know. <laughs> I think Jan was first. Jan, please come in, Jan. He's my co uh, Jan is my colleague, uh, colleague professor uh, at the uh, research center. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm very interested to attend to, to the session and, and to your both presentations. And I just had a few uh, remarks. Uh, one was maybe uh, on the, the, the notion of metalog of Bateson. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I would understand it is um, added to what you said that also the way one goes about uh, engaging in this metalog is telling about the subject that you're taking that you're taking up, for example, if the subject is open-endedness, that the dialogue is open-ended in that way, reflective, yeah, 
I just mm -hmm. have an addition. Thank you. And, and then on the research questions, I thought um, it can also be maybe um, a challenge to how to formulate a research question that is so open and still uh, that you can find a way to, uh, to meet the question. Like, for example, to ask the question in a phenomenological sense, what happens if, thereby not forcing you to any answer, but being attentive very much in the moment to, to whatever manifests itself, or what emerges as you go along. So maybe not every research question has to be so targeted or so um, purposive, framing you, as, as it were. And then maybe related to that, uh, the, the, the talk about borders, uh, Matia, for example, uh, I think it's also interesting uh, next to possibilities of being more in the center of where it happens. And we're looking at borders as uh, blurry, uh, that also maybe to acknowledge borders. And that is maybe this thought of, you have this notion, this sort of cliche of artists are able to think outside of the box. But you can also think about the possibility of thinking inside the box so taking account of the borders, acknowledging them, but then to play with them, which is, I think, very much at the heart of improvisation, that you, you know the rules very well, but then what you can still do within these rules, within these borders, and as an opening rather than as a limitation. Yeah. That's the work of, for example, Stefan Nachmanowicz in his book, uh, Free Play on Improvisation. Or ju just some additions to, to the wonderful things that you shared already. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. I think they're not questions, but remarks. So I think we should uh, continue also because it's 12 o'clock and I hope we can continue for 10 minutes more. Hope you can stay with me for 10 minutes more because I really like to know what questions Celine has. Please come in, Celine. We don't know you. I don't know you. Is that yeah, I'm a first year design, so. Okay, good. welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering because at one point you talked about how we are, um, like created by being seen of, or by uh, interacting with the other. Uh, and I was wondering if it is possible to uh, create art um, just from intrinsical, 100% um, intrinsical art, if it's even possible at all. Celine, I didn't hear your question. There was a bird singing in the yeah. background. I'm I, sorry, yeah. I'm really sorry. I guess sorry. that's the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering if it is possible uh, to have art that is 100% intrinsic. So I was just very curious, uh, Celine, what do you, what do you uh, mean by intrinsic or what, what sort of your take on it? Uh, like art that is not influenced by uh, the outside at all, so mm. not by other like people or just that comes from within. Uh, I didn't hear any of that, so I can't really answer. I'm really sorry. I've got very, yeah. very bad hearing. Um, I think what she's... I can... I can. Do you want uh, me to comment on that, Celine? Yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, Tolly. At, at, for, for, for a long period of my life, I thought so, yes. Uh, and I might think that again. <laughs> so uh, to, to uh, I don't think that again is it. It, 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 it isn't possible to answer it uh, without um, exposing your ethical stance in a way, your position where you are in the world. Um, I think it's in, incredibly um, uh, in, important that that that, that sort of private, uh, personal, only you, me, I have this. Uh, intrinsically, uh, solely mine, <laughs> uh, and that that could come. Sometimes I feel that's the, the only place for it is in art, uh, and it's so important to say that that I think that art is a place for that, and that sometimes the most uh, introvert, uh, even even maybe artists who who cannot, we know them in history who who, who, who aren't able to have social contact with anybody, produces wonderful art, <laughs> uh, which can seem in a way like it's it's. Um, autonomous and completely just theirs and, and unspoilt and uh, whatever you use words you use for it. But I still don't think um, if you're not, uh, and I think aut uh, autistic people or, or people living in isolation also produce art. Uh, but I don't think that doesn't mean that it isn't, uh, um, a, uh, even that I think is a meeting place. And that's probably because where I come from right now, I don't think that we're just, that, that the most personal side of, of us is not only me, I'm constantly communi communicating with a child in me. 
the, the part of me that's scared, the part of me that's optimistic, the part of me that's hungry, the part of, part of me that looks out. Now I can look at snow and sunshine. Yesterday it was raining, you know, uh, the part of me that's um, going to grow old, the part of me that, uh, uh, that wishes for love, the part of me is really fed up with all that. Uh, and all that goes on in me. And I think that's a multitude of voices as well. And they're always communicating. So, I mean, that's probably more like when I say it's a meeting, it's a meeting place, uh, that artistic expression also in some way has to be touched by that communal experience that we also have inside the ones we are. So even when we are at our most private, our most insular, our most sort of um, vulnerable in that respect, because it's just us and we're exposing it in some way, we're also uh, multitudes. Thanks, Tale. Is this okay for now, Celine? I can't see you anymore. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Lola, please come in. Hi, hello. Uh, uh, I have a very, very specific question for you, uh, Tale. Um, when, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I got from you that related to your research, uh, when you were talking about this ethics of change uh, and you were talking about yeah, like that it was very much related to your research and that it came as, uh, that it was very much applied uh, uh, and in action. And then you were also talking about this um, uh, different, um, yeah, the collective writing, the assemblage, the feedback loop. So I was very like curious to hear from you if, if it was this applied kind of uh, research which shape did it take uh, and with whom were you working with? And, and if it's still going on and if it's open for people to join. <laughs> <laughs> you have two minutes, Tale. <laughs> yes, to all of that, uh, definitely. Uh, but I must also warn you guys, if you want to go down that path, it's really tiring. <laughs> Because if you really want to, if you really want to change, I mean, my starting point is that I wanted to change. I wanted something to influence me. I wanted to be shifted. Then actually, uh, if you if you find methods for that, for instance, by collaborating uh, with others in, in writing, for instance, where your writing are influenced, or even maybe when you end up not having the authorship of your writing, <laughs> it's very challenging. I mean, it's, it, it's not a comfortable place to be, um, but it's very, and I can also say, but it's incredibly fruitful. I mean, I have all my romantic ideas of that as not being a place where you produce interesting work is uh, it was totally flawed I mean it's a wonderful way to generate work uh, and I would love to share with you different methods for how that uh, that work uh, can be um, that that uh, uh, digging up a material and producing work can go about can happen Yes, and Lola, I'm sure this will not be the last moment that we will connect with Tale and have conversations with her. There, there will be more moments. And I hope, uh, I really hope that at some moment Majer and Tale can really come to Minerva and we can have workshops together because I once experienced a workshop of Tale and well, that's something you should experience. So there will be more, but uh, now we only have a few minutes left. So uh, thank, thank you. Before you so we, we, we've wind up. I think Silas had a, uh, Silas the Good had a question. Yeah. I, I don't have a question, but I'm, I'm thinking about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, theater practice of Suzuki and viewpoints training. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this whole concept of training with the body in ensemble and only training engagement of choice of the actor, the freedom of the actor to move in ensemble and in, in this container that you want to train in. And um, so there is a, a very uh, strict way of working. So there's a method, we train every morning and there is this way of process of looking, hey, where does the ensemble move to? Uh, how does these ideas of the ensemble, uh, how does the world uh, is involving and how does this whole ensemble is working of creating dialogue uh, with with all these uh, um, yeah with each other and I really uh, would like to ask if there's any reflection on this 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 concept of training and embodiment maybe industry do you want to say something to that Marcia is that outside of the field I'm not trying to talk I, I have no you know I've nothing to say about theater that's uh, but I do martial arts and one of the things I've learned there is this uh, differentiation between technique 
embodiment that then moves into method and then at some point it becomes Priya. And I think it's about the moment of interpretation, that bridge to interpretation and how you, how you reach that moment. And that brings a certain sort of intelligence of thinking that you need, which I would equate with artistic research thinking, maybe. But yeah, yeah this is really Tyler's field. No, I think that was a great answer. Tyler, perhaps you want to add something to that? I think um, Eastern practices have done a lot for the world of theatre uh, due to that, due to uh, that, uh, that mythology, uh, which is both communal and framed within a method um, and leaves freedom for the, for the, um, for the um, performers, uh, has offered so much to, to, um, to the theatre community and also shaped the way we see what theatre can be and the performance we have. The thing I want to say about that actually points back to the idea of, or not the idea, but the topic of the institutions. Because what we often see is that freedom is sort of, um, if, if or let's say if it's a communal theatre production, if it's a, it's a production of actors going together, doing this practice, creating the piece together themselves, it's a communal production or communal process, then, then it can have that kind of feeling that I'm talking about of being a part of a, a reciprocal ethics <laughs> or an ethics of change that sort of encompasses all. Um, but often what we see is that the structure of theatre is hierarchical. So you often have a theatre director or a, or a main artist, someone that shapes that and that uses that material into a production that is, is, is been given a concept either outside it or that sprung from it, that, but art, that is one artist's, um, one artistic um, um, production or, or, or work, let's call it, or, or if it was a camera, it would be an object, right? Which is the performance that is sort of, there's one figure or one thought or one idea that sort of overrules the rest, that then all that material just comes into that and is shaped, shaped inside that structure. And then in a way, I think this, this wonderful idea of the flow of the, of the, of the method and, and the process being one uh, is often lost in a more like uh, um, individual, uh, uh, more Western way of, of, of thinking around what, what an artwork can, can be and, and uh, becomes less relational than it is in its core. Okay. Um, I think that everybody who wanted to ask a question has now asked a question. So then this feels like the right moment to end this session, which should have ended at 12 o'clock, but we continued a bit longer. Thank you very much, Maziar and Tale. It was really inspirational, even, even when it was uh, virtually and you weren't really there. So thank you for that. Um, I think I know what Hannes wants to say, and I wanted to give him the floor to talk about our next session in a week isn't it Hannes please do please come in and talk about it then you will do the moderation in a week so please come in yeah thank you both it was super interesting I think it was a nice discussion and I just wanted to say to everyone who's here we're next Wednesday at 10 o'clock uh, to 12 we're doing another session uh, together with two members of our um, yeah the ARC network uh, Paul and Linda who yeah will present their thoughts and with um, an invited guest from Gothenburg University, Valand, uh, called Madeleine Leach. So if you want to attend that, you're most welcome. And what will yeah, be the topic, Hannes? What? What will be the topic of that next, uh, of the session next week? Our territories, Ima reimagining territories is the topic. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I'm really proud that so many people showed up today and it was worthwhile. Um, what will happen now is that, um, well, this session is over um, at one o'clock, uh, uh, a very small session, the kind of workshop will start with the students from the master IREP, they, they are present here. And I just need to tell them that we will continue in this link. So we will just close for three quarter of an hour and then we will be back and see us you are our in you are invited as well to be present because you had your you shown interest in the master so you can be our guest um well that will be it for now so some of you i will see at one o'clock and i hope that i will see the rest of you uh, in a week when we will have again the really inspiring session together so thank you for attending Thank you for inviting us, everybody. It's a privilege. It's lovely to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you.